So we spent quite a bit of time this semester talking about how to do the modeling around transit over voltages. And what we're going to be discussing this lecture is insulation and surge arresters. And so basically, given that we're going to have these over voltages, are we going to have some type of an insulation failure? And what can we possibly do about it in terms of placing surge arresters near the equipment that we want to be able to protect? So the way I'm going to deal with this right here as far as going through this lecture material is I'm going to first start off by talking about the theory. So talk about some of the insulation basics and how we can model surge arresters and, and what are some characteristics of surge arresters. Then have a worked example on how we actually then apply a surge arrestor and how we could estimate you know, what the performance improvement is going to be. And then I'll show you an example in PSCAD where we actually would then fix the problem we're having with capacitor switching with the surge arrestor, as well show you a more complicated lightning strike example. And this lightning strike example is an example from the PSCAD knowledge forum. And so it actually has a lot more complexity than what we would normally have, like for classroom examples. So getting back to how we actually started the semester, when we talked about the fact that these transit over voltage ratings were different than nominal ratings. And so, for example, for the circuit breaker we talked about, you know, we, we showed that this was a distribution class circuit breaker with rating ranges between 15 and 38 kV. These would correspond to the nominal values of the distribution circuit that they were going to be used in. right? So these are kind of like steady state phaser type values if you want to think about it that way. You would have a continuous current rating, and again this is a phaser type value, so this particular breaker could handle 1200 amperes of current continuously. This would be more or less like your load current. And then you had a number for the short circuit interrupting current in that it can actually disrupt a current in this range depending on the specific switch you're using, uh, much higher value. Note that this is specified as a symmetric value. And so we know now that if you have uh, a, an X to R ratio, that you can actually compute a DC offset where this DC offsets normally factored into the circuit breaker. It's usually designed to operate up to certain X to R ratios. And then it had these different values where we had a full wave withstand with a BIL value, a chopped wave value, and also a transit recovery voltage value. So we've talked about transit recovery voltage, the fact that when a fault is cleared that due to the straight capacitance on the source side of the breaker, we're going to get an over voltage from that, and so we can see the, the protective characteristics for this particular breaker. We know what this means. We talked about modeling lightning strikes, and so this is the BIL level. Note it has different options right here depending on the type of equipment you buy. And then there's another value here which we haven't talked about, chopped wave, which we'll get into in just a, a little bit. But you can start to see now. Um, that basically by going through and doing these different types of over voltage analysis in class, then now we can kind of better understand what these other values in, in equipment data sheet corresponds to. Um, as far as other pieces of equipment, all these other pieces of equipment that we would deal with would have these over voltage transit types of ratings. And so if you go to the standards for transformers like the C57 standards, you'll see for the different distribution and um, transmission transformer sizes that they specify commonly used BIL type levels. And again, this would correspond to the maximum value that you can get for say like a lightning type of waveform. So you can see if you look, for example, for a um, 765 kV transformer that it has BIL values that are much, much higher than 765 because this would be the type of over voltages that you can get uh, associated with you know events such as lightning and so we want to make sure that these transformers at least have some basic insulation levels to, to help them survive transits. <clears throat> 
we've also got um, as, as far as components that we, we work with, we, we've got insulation. And this just shows different types of insulation. You can see in the field up on the upper left, you basically see these uh, kind of pin type um, insulators. Um, basically, this is what you might see on distribution, the upper left and the lower right. Uh, on the upper right, you basically see the types of insulators that you'd have for transmission. And basically, what the insulators do, they provide a separation between the phase conductors and the tower, where a lot of times the tower is going to be metallic and it's going to be grounded. Now, you could also have situations in distribution where you have wooden structures. And the thing I want to point out is not only do these insulators have a voltage rating, but items like wood have a little bit of insulation rating as well. So for example, if you had a couple of these insulators up on top of the pole, the total insulation you would have between these phases would be a combination of the insulator rating plus the length of this wood, where wood would have an insulation value between 50 and 200 kb per foot, depending on the, the treating on that. Um, and, and so anyway, all these components that we work with in practice are going to have these transit over voltage ratings associated with them. One thing that can happen is if we have insulation, say like line insulation, what we can have is we can have a flashover. And so obviously we like to avoid this, the fact that we can have an over voltage between an energized conductor and ground. And one of these modes of failure is going to be when we have ionized air surrounding these insulators, which is, which is pretty common. And so what an ion is, is basically you have an atom that has an excess or deficient number of electrons. It has maybe like a net negative charge or a net positive charge. And let's say we talk about electron, uh, electrons um, that are kind of loose around a um, insulator because of uh, ionization taking place, the thing we need to worry about is what's called electron avalanche. And so if you would have a situation where you have an insulator, you've got some of these free electrons circulating around. If you apply a field, if you apply a field, in this case, um, what you would have is you would have a field which would maybe be, say, like in this direction here, then what that's going to do, that's going to serve to accelerate that electron. And that electron is going to hit another atom, which is going to kick another few electrons loose. And given that you, if you have that electric field still there, then that's going to accelerate even more electrons, which are going to hit more atoms. And all of a sudden, you've got a whole bunch of loose electrons circulating around an insulator. Um, and then what's going to happen because of this is that you're going to have the, the air insulation fail. And you kind of get what we're showing here in the lower, excuse me, the lower right hand diagram, where if you have this electron avalanche around an insulator, then basically you're going to get a flashover type of an effect. This is going to be dependent, obviously, on the electric field strength, and it's also going to be dependent on how long that um, over voltage is going to last, right? So if you have an over voltage for a short period of time, you might be okay. Um, but if you have that same level of over voltage for a longer period of time, then that's just more electrons that are going to get accelerated, which is going to result in this, this uh, avalanche type of an effect. So as far as insulation strength with respect to resistance to avalanche type failures, you're going to have this curve that's kind of shown right here where if you're on the left-hand side of the curve, the insulation is going to be okay. On the right-hand side of the curve, you're going to be susceptible to electron avalanche. So given that we know something about insulation, and, and now that we know something about doing the analysis for overvoltages, we can start thinking in terms of insulation coordination. And it's kind of similar to protection coordination in a way where given that you're going to have these different types of fault events for protection, you're trying to figure out how to kind of put fuses and reclosers and circuit breakers out there to protect your circuit against damage, to make sure you don't have any issues with safety. 
and to improve reliability. And the same thing can be done as far as looking at your insulation and basically try to figure out how to set this up so your system is not as susceptible to overvoltage transits. And so again, it's a combination of different things just like protection. We're basically we're, we're trying to protect our equipment from being permanently damaged like transformers. Um, and we're also trying to figure out how to do that economically in a way that we also minimize the, the number of uh, failures not only due to transformers but say like lightning um, insulation flashing over and causing outages in our transmission grid all right so what you need to know for this is kind of the things we've been getting into this semester is basically how we're going to model this how we're going to model this over voltage stress basically we're, we're trying to figure out in this particular case um, how we can kind of quantify how we can kind of quantify these values for over voltage. And this is where tools like PSCAD come in useful. We've also got to know something about the strength of our insulation. And so this is given in terms of various tables on manufacturers' data sheets. And then what we're getting into in this specific lecture is protection options. And, and particularly what we're concerned with in this case is we're concerned with the use of surge arresters. And so what we want to be able to figure out is how we can use these surge arresters to protect our, our key equipment. And then this has also got to be done in, in kind of like the whole context of making sure we can do this all economically. Because obviously we can spend a lot of money and put surge arresters all over the place and use equipment that have very high BIO ratings and never have anything fail. But that's going to be extremely expensive. And so when we're, when we're looking at all this, then what we have to be um, cognizant of is we got to be cognizant of is when we have these different over voltages and what's going to be the, the magnitude of this stress, or in other words, what's going to be the peak voltage, and we've been kind of talking about this all semester. Uh, we also need to know something about the rate at which the stress is applied because insulation is sensitive to DVDT and also how long this is going to be occurring for. And one thing we just have to be aware of when we get into insulation coordination calculations, this is not a deterministic analysis. So for example, if I apply a stress to a component, it may fail, it may not. It's very, very dependent on what's kind of going on as far as the ambient conditions, how many loose electrons we have around something. Um, you know, it's, it's very, very probabilistic in nature, which is why a lot of times we're going to use kind of like probabilistic uh, techniques to actually do this simulation. You've seen, for example, like a lot of the stress is dependent on point of wave, but when a switching action occurs, we don't always know what the point of wave it is, right? So how do we model this? Well, we would assign a certain probability um, density function to what the point of wave is, and then we would do some, uh, what we call Monte Carlo simulation, where we do these repeated runs with programs like PSCAD to kind of figure out what's the probability of failure where when you factor in the uncertainty on, on things like point of wave. And so we can we could do this in a way that's kind of similar to, to protection coordination. Uh, the other thing we got to take into account when we're looking at insulation failure is, is there's self-healing insulation and there's non- healing insulation. So self-healing insulation would be where you have a breakdown of air or some other gas like we would with with uh, insulation on overhead. So if we get a flashover on the overhead, all we need to do basically once the fault occurs is detect that with the relay and open up the circuit breakers on either end. When the circuit breakers are open long enough, the air around the flashover point is, is going to deionize and we can basically switch both ends of the line back in again. So that's just a, a, a delay factor. But if you have damage of, you have an over voltage on transformers or a cable, that's not self hanging You just have to replace the components. Uh, and so we have to keep this in mind too, like what's, what's self-healing insulation versus non-healing insulation. Um, as far as the strength characteristics, Basically, we're going to have a voltage time curve as shown at the bottom of this slide. 
And so I can apply um, kind of high values of voltage for short periods of time, or I can apply lower values of voltage for longer periods of time, we're still going to be okay. I would have a curve with this particular volt time characteristic, and the better the insulation is, the more this curve kind of shifts up and to the right. And so this shows three different insulations. And as long as I'm to the left of this curve, generally I'm going to be okay. If I'm going to be to the right of this curve, I'm not going to be okay. So as far as modeling this, um, you know, there's a way we can actually map this into two different exponentials. We can actually do a fit to this curve. Um, you may use like a number of points to model the curve and maybe use interpolation. But basically, insulation is going to have these types of characteristics, these types of both time curves uh, associated with it. Now, whether a flashover is going to occur or not is defined by critical flashover voltage. And as I mentioned before, if I were doing testing in a lab, like a medium voltage or high voltage lab, I'm testing a circuit breaker withstand to surges. And let's suppose I'm hitting that with a 100 kV pulse. A certain number of times that's good, may be failing, but a certain number of times it's not. Again, this depends on a lot of conditions, you know, like well, what are the number of free electrons around my, my insulating um, devices. And so what critical flashover voltage is, if I do a number of different tests with the same waveforms, that's going to be the peak voltage for which the flashover is going to occur 50% of the time. Um, and, and so anyway, if I have a certain type of transit wave shape that I'm using in my lab, again, this is not deterministic. I run a whole series of these tests, and I, I find the 50% point, and that's going to be my critical flashover voltage. When we're also doing this insulation testing, we, we also apply different types of waveforms, you know, waveforms that are associated with lightning versus switching events. And when we talk about modeling lightning and looking at basic insulation levels, we, we basically use a lot of times what's referred to as a 1 by 2 by 50 curve. So this is a curve where you have a rise time of 1.2 microseconds, and then it's going to decay out where we're going to hit half of the peak voltage at 50 microseconds. And so this is what we would use for, for lightning, uh, looking at lightning resistance, is we would use this sort of like a BIL test curve. When we're looking at switching actions, then there's another curve we would use. Um, the types of numbers we would get from this would be what we refer to as uh, basic switching impulse insulation level, or BSL values. And in this case, what we're going to use is a 250 microsecond rise time and a 2500 microsecond decay time because when you look at the switching surges that occur, the initial um, rise in the voltage is spread out over a longer period of time than what we have for lightning. And so we would use a, a different curve in this particular test to see what the resistance of components would be to switching actions, like say when we're energizing a line. And then chopped waves are used for modeling what would happen if we had to like an insulation flashover or surge arrestor activated. So on the left shows kind of a what looks like a conventional overvoltage. And so what we see is the voltage is starting to rise. And then all of a sudden, what happens is this voltage just transitions right to zero. Now, why would something like that happen? Well, let's suppose if you had a lightning striking overhead and you have an overvoltage, and this is the overvoltage that was seen like at an insulator. If that insulator flashes over, basically what that looks like is it just looks like a almost like a dead short circuit. And so this is what you would have. This is what you would have if you'd have like a flashover effect. Or later on, we talk about the surge arrestor. As soon as that surge arrestor clamps, it's basically going to, could cause a rapid drop in the voltage. Now, how we model something like this, if you're doing this in PSCAD, I mean, you wouldn't have to worry about this. But let's suppose you're going to do this by hand and you're going to use these pulse bounce, these traveling wave diagrams. 
the way you would actually represent this is by using superposition. So you would analyze a circuit using this particular waveform, kind of like your conventional wave shape. And then what you would superimpose on this is a second waveform that would basically force the net voltage to zero. So you basically you could do two pulse bounce diagrams. You do one pulse diagram for this waveform, you do a second pulse diagram for this waveform, you superimpose the, the two together and you get the final result. And what you basically see is that this type of a chopped wave has a big DVDT value associated with it. And this would put a, another type of stress on our, on our insulation. And so this type of stress is, is referred to as a chopped wave. It actually is a third category. So the first category would be like the BIL values associated with lightning, basic switching level values associated with line switching. And then the third set would be the chopped waves you get with the high dBT values when you have a flashover occur. And those are generally the three types of things that we would analyze when we do the insulation coordination. So again, you can kind of think about this the way you would think about um, protection is you can, you can have different places where you'd actually try to do your protection um, at. Um, so example of what something like this might look like, let's see if I can get this to work right here. Is let's suppose you had a substation and in this substation you had a transformer. And this transformer is going to have a certain BIL associated with it, right? So it's got a BIL value. Yeah. It's got a certain BIL value. And then you you got this attached to an overhead line. And this this overhead line, let's see if I could reset this again. This overhead line would have a certain BIL value associated with it as well. And so maybe lightning could strike over here on the left someplace. Lightning could strike over here on the left someplace. All right, then what you could have over here is you could have a surge arrestor and the surge arrestor is going to be connected up between the, the wire and ground, all right? So basically, you've got this type of configuration right here, all right? So how is this insulation coordination, or how is this even coordination? Well, basically, the way this could be set up is if you have lightning strike, and let's suppose that's like a monster lightning strike. Well, what you're going to get here is you're going to get like a flashover, right? So basically what you've done through the flashover is you've basically shunted all this energy to ground. So if it's a really monster strike, basically this is going to be taken care of on the transmission tower. Now you're going to take a, an outage because of that, but at least that huge overvoltage isn't hitting that transformer on the far right. Now let's suppose that you get the big transit and it doesn't cause any type of a flashover. Well, then this tra this uh, overvoltage surge is going to be traveling toward that transformer. And now what? Let's suppose that overvoltage surge was greater than the BL, BAL rating of the transformer. Well, what would happen next is the surge arrestor would kick in. And the surge arrestor would tend to clip that voltage. And it would clip it at a level that would be lower than the BIL of the transformer. So anyway, this isn't going to be perfect. I mean, it's going to let a little bit of surge energy through, but at least it's going to clip enough of it where it's not going to permanently damage the transformer. And so this is the way insulation coordination would work. And then you just have to realize that switching surges have different characteristics in lightning, right? And so maybe if you had a switching surge on the far left-hand side, um, maybe that's not going to cause a flashover. Maybe that's um, not even going to get caught by that surge arrestor. Well, what are you going to do about that then? 
Oh, this is where you, you can do things like use pre-insertion resistors on the switches. So when you switch in a voltage, let's say, you put the pre-insertion resistor in there and you use that to kind of minimize the, the switching surge. And so there's this is the sort of thinking you would have if you're doing insulation coordination. It's kind of similar again to protection coordination. You know, we have different levels that we can actually protect at, but you're thinking about, well, what sort of different things could I add to the circuit in order to protect critical components like transformers, because transformers have really huge order times. It's a very difficult component to replace. The other thing you, you have to take into account is that, you know, everything's kind of probabilistic in nature and it's probably not going to be feasible to protect against everything given all the uncertainty out there. And so the way you're, you're thinking about this is kind of reflected in this diagram where what you have on the left is kind of like the probability of the different sort of stresses that could occur. Uh, and so this is like a probability sort of a function here. And maybe, um, you know, you've got a certain probability of low voltages. You've got a certain probability associated with median level voltages. Maybe this is what you kind of pick up in your analysis. But then, if it, again, if you had these really big lightning strikes, certain sort of a worst case events, the stress level could get pretty high in terms of voltage. As far as your insulation characteristics then, Basically, now you have the strength of your insulation. And we know that if the voltage gets super high, it's just going to fail, right? But then at lower values of voltage, you know, it's going to have a um, lower probability of failure. This point right here around where the curves intersect and where you have more stress than your insulation um, is what's kind of referred to as, as the risk you're taking. And so the fact that if you had any stress at all, um, it, up to a certain point is going to going to represent a risk. So the fact that, you know, like you're, you have some uncertainty about your strength in your insulation is going to pose a risk. And so if you look at this intersection between these two curves, this is kind of like the, the certain amount of risk that you're going to have. Um, obviously, you want to keep this as small as possible. But if you're trying to set your insulation up where it's going to handle all sorts of different over voltages, that's going to be really, really expensive, right, to kind of shift this curve over to the right. And so when we're doing insulation coordination, you know, we, we in inevitably assume a certain amount of risk because the cost of actually not having this risk at all is going to be very, very high. We can't afford really to be risk free. And so, again, this would be kind of your thinking is, you know, what amount of intersection of these two curves am, am I going to be allowed to live with? And then as far as the options, you know, what can you do if you decide something needs to be done? Well, you could have higher BIL ratings for your equipment, but this is going to be very expensive. Uh, you could put up shielding wires for lightning, but, but generally those are going to be already up there. Um, these turn out not to be effective for distribution, by the way. You could Minimize the impact of lightning strikes by having better grounding. So you could put more ground stakes in the ground. You could put um, pre-insertion resistors in your circuit breakers for energizing lines. And so you minimize impact of um, that. And then the next thing we're going to talk about is the addition of surge arresters. So a surge arrestor is basically a device that we put between the surge, which is going to be on the left, and the equipment we want to protect. It's, it's In a way, it's kind of a sacrificial device that's going to absorb the surge energy. And so this surge is going to be characterized by a voltage magnitude as well as having a surge impedance on the line that this surge is traveling down. And basically, the way we're going to do that is we're going to put the surge arrestor in between between the surge and between the equipment we're trying to protect. And it turns out we want to get the surge arrestor as close as we can to that piece of equipment. So all this excess energy is going to be absorbed by, absorbed by the surge arrestor. Ideally, what we would want for this to work 
is under normal voltage conditions, when this voltage is below a certain level, we want the surge arrestor to look like an open circuit. It's like it's not there. And then as soon as this voltage gets above a critical point, we basically want this surge arrestor to look like a short. All right. So in order to do something like this, we're going to need some sort of a nonlinear element because it's going to have to be unactive in normal range of voltage and then it's going to have to kind of self-activate when the voltage gets too high where it can damage this equipment on the right. Um, and so anyway, what we, we would need here ideally is either a switch or some sort of very nonlinear device. The early technology for this was to just have an air gap. This goes back to the Benjamin Franklin days where basically the voltage gets too high. Basically this small air gap, the insulation is going to fail. And what this is going to do, this is going to short out, and this is going to route the surge energy to ground. So this is how you would protect a piece of equipment. So this would be the cheapest sort of thing you can do, would be to have an air gap, and then this is going to stay ionized as long as you have this overvoltage driving the circuit. When the overvoltage is gone, the air de-energizes, and it would be self-healing type of insulation. But that only is going to protect us um, against really, really large overvoltages, right? And so what we use instead for surge arresters, we, we typically would want to have some sort of a nonlinear resistance. So the nonlinear resistance is going to be such where if I take the ratio of the voltage to a voltage reference, I take that to a really high power, what I get is a very highly nonlinear characteristic, which is useful for damping these surges. The prevailing technology now would be to use metal oxide, uh, have what we call metal oxide baristers or MOBs. And these would have values of A between 20 and 50, so very highly nonlinear. Before this, we used another material called silicon carbide, which had a lower value for A and didn't, it was not quite as nonlinear. We would still see this in maybe some older surge arresters. And so, whereas um, an MOV, once it got above a certain voltage, would rapidly saturate. Um, silicon carbide doesn't saturate as fast. This is why when you see silicon carbide based arresters, that this is usually used in conjunction with an air gap and an arc suppressor um, because the material by itself does, is not sufficiently nonlinear to basically protect our, our equipment. And so this is kind of a hybrid device that would not be something we would probably purchase now, but you might see this on more legacy systems. What we would use more now would be these metal oxide surge arresters or MOVs. And the idea would be that this is going to be a very, very, very high impedance during normal conditions and a very low impedance during the surge. And then we have to make sure that this can dissipate enough energy right, in order to absorb this surge. If this sur device survives, then after the surge is over, then this goes back to a high impedance then. So the way you can think about this as far as analysis would be, if you looked at the equivalent circuit that the surge sees, it's basically this voltage associated with the surge impedance. There's going to be a relationship between E, I, and Z basically says that E divided by I is going to be given by the surge impedance. Um, that's assuming that this value for the equipment we're protecting, this value Z2, is going to be a lot higher than Z1, which is normally the case. And so let's suppose this is 300 ohms, let's say. This Z2 value is usually a lot higher than that. And so from the standpoint of the surge arrestor, this is going to have a a characteristic, what we call the circuit load line, which looks like this kind of like reddish line right here. Now if E increases, basically what that does is shifts this curve to the right. If E decreases, it shifts this curve to the left. If the surge impedance changes, it changes the slope of this curve. The surge of, in, the surge arrestor itself has a nonlinear characteristic, which is shown by the green line. And the intersection of these two curves 
is going to be the operating point. And so what we could see is as we would shift this E versus I curve over to the right, basically we see because of the nonlinear characteristics of the arrestor, it tends to clamp the voltages to about the same value. It's actually going to go up a little bit as the, the surge magnitude increases. But you can see because of the nonlinear characteristics, what this arrestor does is it kind of clamps the, the voltage to roughly about the same value, which we're going to see in the, in the worked example. And so if I know the IV characteristics of the surge arrestor, and if I know the magnitude of the source voltage and the surge impedance, I can kind of predict what I'm going to be seeing as far as the voltage. And then I could figure out, well, this is going to be low enough for protect my equipment on the right. As far as surge arrestor terminology, some terms you see is you see what's called maximum continuous operating voltage. That's one term, MCOV. It turns out that with these nonlinear devices, you need to keep the voltage below a certain level. Otherwise, you start drawing current, which heats the device up. And when you heat the device up, it even draws a little bit more current until we have what's called a thermal runaway effect. And so we need to make sure that we size this in such a way where this maximum continuous overvoltage is not violated under kind of like normal conditions. Uh, we've also got like a rated voltage for the arrestor. This is going to be a little bit higher than MCOV. This is the sort of maximum voltage you're going to um, have when you have kind of normal what we call power frequency events, kind of 60 hertz, 60 hertz type events, say like due to fault conditions or say like ferroresonance. Um, and then as far as the IV characteristics, sometimes we talk about a reference voltage and a reference current, where the reference voltage is something we're going to use in order for figuring out the I versus V characteristics. And so, again, what we have to keep in mind is we got to keep this voltage across the arrestor under normal conditions. Uh, and I include faults in here as kind of a normal condition because it's not an over voltage, but it's a condition that could occur. But we got to make sure the voltage stays um, below these two values here. Otherwise, we can actually destroy the arrestor in the field. This shows some typical arrestor ratings. This is for a GE Tranquil class device. And this is something you would see like in the data tables from the vendor. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll tell you for given sort of line voltages, which arrestor would be recommended, which arrestor rating would be recommended and what its MCLV value would be. So for example, if you had a 12.47 kV circuit, um, which would have a line to ground value of 7.2 kV, then they would recommend that you would go with a 9 kV arrestor, where this is connected up phase to ground. And it would have an, an MCLV value if you were using a porcelain unit, a 7.65. And so you would want to make sure that your voltage uh, would not get uh, above this particular value under for long periods of time, right? Otherwise, you would actually have thermal runaway and you would actually destroy your arresters. So anyway, you, you would go with these application tables here and you would choose the, the appropriate arrestor rating um, for your particular voltage level. What you've also seen in the data sheets for your selection is you also see, well, what would the arrestor actually clamp voltages down for the different types of waveforms. And so if you had like a, a very fast surge, you know, like a 0.5 microsecond type of voltage, um, basically it would clamp to 8.4. If you had a switching surge, it would clamp to 6. And then basically you have an IV curve um, where the voltage you can clamp to kind of depends on how much current you have associated with the surge. And you kind of see that if you have smaller current levels, you can actually clamp to lower voltages than you would for the higher current levels. Um, but, it, you know, it kind of stays within kind of a somewhat tight range in here over really high values of these, of these, um, of these over voltage related currents. So anyway, you, you, you 
can you get these values for different ratings of surge arresters? And then the other thing we would have to check would be for your particular case, do you have enough energy handling capability? And so this is usually expressed in terms of kilojoules per kilovolt. And so this tells you how many kilojoules of this transit surge energy you can actually dissipate in terms of heat. And this is basically heat transfer that's occurring from this semiconductor material to the housing and eventually to air. And this is why you have different types of energy, you have different types of devices where sometimes they talk about station class arresters, intermediate class arresters, distribution arresters, etc. Because you want to have different energy handling capabilities for these different classes. And so for the different voltage levels, you know, say if you had intermediate station class, um, then you would have, you know, so many kilo, kilojoules per kV um, that you can actually dissipate. And when you do these simulations in PSCAD, you could actually see the number of kilojoules that would be dissipated. And if you divide this by the kV rating, you could determine like whether this arrestor would, would be destroyed or not and trying to protect against a certain type of transit. All right. When we look at applying these surge arresters, something we look at is we look at what our margins are. We, we talk about these protection ratios. And so if I have a, a certain strength of the insulation or I'm clamping to a certain level versus the stress level I expect to see, we, we can talk about that in terms of protection ratio. And typically we wanna over design a little bit um, to make sure we have enough margin. So you'll see these ratios, and this is defined in a standard uh, ANSI 62.22, which is about insulation coordination. And what you'll see is you'll see like a, a ratio for lightning, this is BIL. And so you look at what this, um, this protection you're going to have with respect to the incoming waveform. We kind of like this to be better than 1.2. You have a ratio for switching surges. You have a ratio for chopped waves. And this is just so you have a certain amount of margin because there's uncertainty when you do these calculations. And so you want to make sure you have some margin in there in case you're off as far as your calculations. And so anyway, this is just some examples, you know, as far as having a, a transformer um, withstand voltage. And then if we're putting arresters out there, you know, we could check to see, you know, well, what kind of margin we have with respect to what the arrestor could do with respect to how much the transformer could actually absorb. Uh, one last thing I want to mention is that when you have surge arresters, it's very, very important to get the surge arrestor as close as you can to the device you're trying to protect. So if you have lead lengths, say between the line that the surge is coming in and the surge arrestor, there's going to be a voltage across here, across the lead. Same way if you have a, a lead between where the arrestor is attached and the component you're trying to protect, you're going to have an overvolge across here. So the problem is that the surge arrestor is going to clamp to a certain value, but then you have to add the voltage rise you can have across the lead here and the voltage rise you can have across this lead right here. If you have too much lead length in here, then you risk damaging the, the component you're trying to protect because you the lead length actually factors a lot into um, what the net voltage you're going to see across the transformer is going to be. So you have to sum all these three voltages up to figure out what's going to be the stress actually applied to the transformer. And so you always see application notes talk about this where you can have so many feet, like say of lead length, without kind of compromising how the surge arrestor is going to work. So I'll do a worked example and kind of talk about how we can actually do the arrestor calculations by hand and then we'll have another video segment that kind of talks about how we can do the analysis of this in PSCAD.